good to be here this morning and we have a beautiful amount of snow on the ground and it's just enough that it's turned everything real nice but good enough to drive in so great so I'm gonna to start today by um, asking you guys a question so be honest and know that this is a safe zone you won't be judged if you raise your hand so raise your hand if you have ever made a New Year's resolution in your life. All right, that's pretty many of us. All right, good. Now that wasn't so bad. Now I'm gonna ask you another one and I'm curious to see what happens. So, um, so those who raise your hand, raise it again. Now keep it raised if you've kept your resolution through the whole year. That's what I suspected might happen. There'd be a few, ah, maybe, no, well, not so many though. So um, why do you think this is? It's very interesting. As I reflected on this turn of year from 2018 to 19, I was struck by the fact that New Year's has become, or maybe has always been, and I just never noticed, another money-making scheme and also has become really selfish. Now I'm speaking very generally about New Year's, the New Year's resolutions that people generally advertise to. I'm sure there are some really great selfless resolutions out there. So, but if you think of some of the biggest New Year's resolutions, many involve money to get you a gadget, a membership, or item to help you with your resolution. And many resolutions just simply focus completely on yourself. Being more organized involves buying things to organize all your stuff, or else you just solely focus on purging your home that you become obsessed with it. Losing weight or getting into shape involves gym memberships. Eating healthier may involve special foods for your diet. Reducing stress involves perhaps buying massages or other stress relief methods. Learning to cook or bake involves buying new pantry items. I'm not saying that New Year's resolutions are bad, but I do wonder, is this what God intended for us to do with our time, money, and energy? Why all the hype over New Year's? I didn't feel any different from December 31 to January 1, although maybe a little more tired because I did stay up late playing some scum with some people at Deer Park. So that was a good way to ring in the new year. But please do not hear me that um, I think that making New Year's resolutions is bad. Or don't feel ashamed if you raised your hand. I have totally made resolutions that I definitely didn't keep throughout the year. Resolutions are not bad things. It's when they consume us or we buy into the hype of it all that it becomes concerning. I saw a tweet from Christian comedian John Christ on his social media account. He said this regarding the week after Christmas. December 26 to December 31, a week full of behavior that you're like, okay, fine, but I'm stopping this come 2019. <laughs> and how true is that, that we act one way a few days before New Year's, then expect we will magically end that behavior once a new day and a new year has begun. I think there's something that the world is attracted to about a fresh start. Many people my age are attracted to the idea of moving somewhere and getting this fresh start in a new place. Or if you're like me and still have a paper planner and journal, it's so exciting to have a brand new planner or journal to fill up. So if people are so attracted to newness, why doesn't the newness of our lives in Christ attract more people? New Year's is a time that the world says is for us, indulgence of New Year's Eve, then restraint of resolutions. But in Christ, we have new lives at any time, day or night, beginning, middle, or end of the year. And God's newness, that he offers includes others and is so opposite 
of what the world says about New Year's. In our text today, Paul gives insight on the excitement of newness that God offers us through Christ. So if you'd like to follow along, you can turn to 2 Corinthians 5. And I know in the bulletin it says 14 to 18, but I'll, I'm actually going to read 14 to 21. So 2 Corinthians 5, 14 through 21. For the love of Christ compels us, since we have reached this conclusion. If one died for all, then all died. And he died for all, so that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for the one who died for them and was raised. From now on, then, we do not know anyone from a worldly perspective, even if we have known Christ from a worldly perspective. Yet now we no longer know him in this way. Therefore, If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away, and see, the new has come. Everything is from God, who has reconciled us to himself through Christ, and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and he has committed the message of reconciliation to us. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, since God is making his appeal through us. We plead on Christ's behalf. Be reconciled to God. He made the one who did not know sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. So the first thing I want to focus on today is found in verses 14 and 15. Here we have Paul giving the Corinthian church the reason why he shares with others about Christ. Earlier, he states that the fear of the Lord spurs him to persuade others in verse 11. But in verse 14, he states that the love of Christ compels us. Now, compel is a strong word defined as to drive or urge forcefully or irresistibly. In the IVP New Testament commentary, it says, The basic sense of to compel is to hold something together so that it does not fall apart. The idea is that Christ's love completely controls and dominates Paul so that he has no option but to preach. My immediate thought upon reading this was, so this is what compelled Paul to speak about Christ, so what compels me? It's quite a convicting question. To be honest, I know I'm not the best at sharing Christ with others, which I'm working on. It helps that I tell people that I'm a youth pastor, and then that kind of gets the conversation going. But if I was someone who just attended church regularly, sat in the pew each week, what would I, an introvert who keeps to herself out in public, say to others to let them know that I have indeed been changed by Christ? Perhaps it begs the question, why aren't we compelled to share Christ with others? It's not a fun question to ask, but it may also reveal a lot about you. Paul then ends with the conclusion, if one died for all, then all died. From my readings of commentaries, this section seems to allude to Paul's statement made in Galatians 3.28. There is no Jew or Greek, slave or female, male or female, Oh, sorry, slave or free, male and female, since you are all one in Christ Jesus. Jesus has no exceptions on who he died for. Yet Paul acknowledges that only those who choose to live receive the benefits and blessings of Christ's death. One of those benefits or blessings of accepting and acknowledging Christ's death is that we no longer live for ourselves but for the one who has died, who had died and raised, was raised. Now here we can circle back to our New Year's theme. While the world screams at us to live for ourselves and satisfy our wants, needs, desires by ourselves, often it doesn't pan out that way. I have found that the more we try to live for ourselves or buy our happiness, the emptier we feel. I think innately we find value in serving others. 
which is why many volunteer for organizations, which is great. But in Christ, we are compelled to volunteer, love others, serve Christ in fulfilling ways because of what Christ has done for us. It's in these verses that Paul alludes to this new life and new creation of Christ. So the second thing I want to pull out of the text today is that we, in Christ, we are a new creation. If you want a new start, here's this wonderful, complex, beautiful opportunity to begin anew in Christ. Verse 17 says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away, and see, the new has come. Now this is a truth that can be pondered and thought about for a lifetime. While we are made new in Christ, remember, it's not an overnight thing. It's not a switch you can flip from New Year's Eve to New Year's Day. I would compare it to being made, I would compare being made into a new creation as forming a piece of artwork. The artist makes something so beautiful out of a blank canvas. It takes time. Sometimes the artist messes up, but messes get corrected. Did I mention it takes time? And the artist has patience with the piece of art that becomes more and more beautiful as it gets worked on. This verse was a theme verse for me for maybe a year and a half. Um, I was attending spiritual direction and really just working through things in my past that harbored shame and guilt that I had been holding on to for years. I put everything on my mind from the past and present on the table for my spiritual director to hear and to guide me. I kept coming back to this verse because while those things are still in my past, I realize that they no longer define me. Do I need to work through those things each day? Yeah, better believe it. I still have something from high school that I realized was an idol in my life, and I still think about it from time to time. And this all started 16 years ago. But when it does come up, I place it in my hands, and I give it back to God again. It's like sin comes in and puts an ugly blotch on that piece of art, only for the artist to paint over it and make it disappear. I found a quote in the Believer's Church Bible Commentary that helps explain this newness in Christ. The process is redemptive, not destructive. For the new creation does not destroy the old, but recreates it. This does not mean to destroy and begin again with a clean slate. I have found in my life that God redeems and recreates me in themes, intervals, and stages of life. And in those times, God replaces something in my life with a breath of fresh air from him. One year in high school, love was my theme. In many seasons of life, God had to pound it into my head that I needed to put my identity only in him. In another season, I dealt with inadequacy, where God had to whisper in my ear creative ways to tell me that I was a beloved child of his. And I could go on and on with what God has taught me over the years. Becoming a new creation also involves listening to what God has to say in the different seasons of life. Sometimes he does teach in yearly increments, but most of the times, it's however the Holy Spirit moves, which could take a few months or a few years. Returning to our Bibles, other texts that talk about newness in Christ come to us in Galatians 2.20, which says, I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Another one comes to us in Romans 6, 6 through 11, which says, For we know that our old self was crucified with him, so that the body ruled by sin might be rendered powerless, so that we may no longer be enslaved to sin. Since a person who has died is freed from sin. Now if we died with Christ, 
we believe that we will also live with him because we know that Christ, having been raised from the dead, will not die again. Death no longer rules over him. For the death he died, he died to sin once for all time. But the life he lives, he lives to God. So you too consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. I'm struck by the fact that both of those verses talk about life, death and life. Life is in Christ and death is without Christ. Remember how I talked about how on New Year's we're often searching for something to fulfill our wants, needs, and desires? It doesn't come from a resolution that you try to work at on your own power. It comes from Christ alone who gives us life and fulfillment. And while the old that God will tear away from us doesn't disappear overnight, we can rest assured that we are in good hands. The third part I want to pull out of this is the topic of reconciliation. Reconciliation is defined as the state of being reconciled, and reconcile is defined to restore to friendship or harmony, settle or resolve, to make consistent. This section in verses 18 through 21 is Paul's view of pushing out what it means to be a new creation in Christ. Not only have we been made new in Christ, but now we have a gift given to us and a job to do. Help others to be reconciled to God. Now when I think of reconciliation, I immediately think of one of my college classes called conflict mediation. Now this was a weird class for me because I found it to be easy yet really hard at the same time. And I was also quite vocal in this class, which was rare for me to do. Um, we learned about restorative justice, how to mediate a conflict, circle processes, all great things that you need to learn when you're working with those in conflict. I learned a lot, but in the final project, we had to mediate a non-existent conflict between two people who were also students in the class who were given a conflict but not told what to say. And my partner and I had to mediate this conflict, make everything good between the feuding parties, and get it all on camera. But aside from my lack of enthusiasm for this final project, due to the unrealistic setting we had to work with, I realized throughout the class that reconciliation is hard work. Where people, opinions, and feelings come together, it's not always a picnic in the park. And this is the very reason why I praise God. He reconciled us to himself. He initiated, we did not. And he made it very easy for us. All we need to do is accept this gift of life that he has given to us in Christ. And then God is so good that he gives us additional gifts after we accept this gift of salvation. He's such a giver. These gifts include administration, apostleship, discernment, evangelism, exhortation, faith, giving, healing, interpretation of tongues, knowledge, leadership, mercy, miracles, Pastor, shepherd, prophecy, serving, ministering, teaching, tongues, and wisdom. That's a lot of gifts. <laughs> there is truth to verse 20 that we are indeed ambassadors for Christ. We represent Christ in our speech, conduct, choices, and so on. I think ultimately our goal is to help reconcile others to God, which was the essence of the Great Commission. Thankfully, the hard work of reconciliation of others to God is not completely ours to accomplish. God empowers us and gives us the tools when we need them. And he knows how to best use our gifts in the process. So while Paul was reconciling others to God through perhaps evangelism or teaching, our gift of reconciliation of others to God may look like service, teaching in Sunday school, or giving to others. How amazing that after we are made into a new creation in Christ, we get to help play a part 
in God's plan of reconciling people to him. So my question to you is this. How are you pointing to other, pointing others towards God with your gifts? If you don't know, I would encourage you to pray about it, talk with wise brothers and sisters in Christ, and see what God reveals to you. So maybe this year, if you made a resolution and already broke it, or are still staying strong with it, ask God to reveal to you ways to live out your love for Christ, but at the same time, point others towards him. Maybe that looks like picking a theme verse. Maybe you strive to say one positive thing about your church to a stranger each week. But whatever God reveals to you, give yourself grace in the journey. And don't put time constraints on the Holy Spirit. God was grace-filled with the Israelites when they messed up, and the same with the disciples. And then a shining example of grace-filled newness in life is Paul himself, whose life was completely turned around by Christ. So I'm going to close my time here today with two things. Um, the first is a paragraph from Better Families, which we actually get in our mailboxes, and then a time of reflection. So this reading from Better Families is a good summary of many of the things I talked about today. So it says, <coughs> excuse me, <clears throat> we all want and need new beginnings, a fresh, clean, untainted start. We think a new home, a new job, a new spouse, a new car, a new state, or a new name can do that. It cannot. We are given a new start with every choice we make. We can choose to do what is right or choose to do what is wrong. Every morning we are given a new day to begin making new choices. Every opportunity can be a new beginning for us, but only the true new beginning is when we come before Jesus and confess to him our sin and shortcomings. Then, and only then, can we truly start new and fresh. Now, I'm going to play a song, and we're going to have a time of reflection. Um, sometimes I think in services you hear so much and you don't get to fully chew on things um, that you've heard. But it's called, I'm going to play the song, Lead Me to the Cross. And during that, I would encourage you to take some time in prayer. Or if you just want to pray the words that come up on the screen, you can do that. But think about, what does God want you to learn right now? How is he calling you to live out your new creation life in Christ? What is he calling you to let go of? Maybe you're the same, in the same old season of life looking for something new. Or maybe you're in the middle of constant change and need some stability of a theme verse or a word. Whatever it may be, these next four minutes are for you to sit with God. And once the song is over, I would invite Greg, are you leading the song? You can come up right after the song is over. Redemption 